The following interview was conducted <coughs> with Gerald, Gold, uh, Gerald Goldman for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March the 17th, 2008 at Stewart Center, room 263. This is part two of the interviewer. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Uh, we want to, when we left off the last time was MAPADI, the Midwest Program for Airborne um, Television Instruction. And you, why did the program end, and it was an approximate length of time, was eight years. Well, uh, the program was, uh, was absolutely uh, outstanding when, when judged in, uh, in the light of educational value. And uh, it was a new idea, of course, to transmit uh, from an airplane into a many state area and so forth, and, and right into the school rooms. And uh, the educational value was, uh, was outstanding. The best teachers in the country were brought to Purdue to make the tapes and so forth. And uh, the financing was, as, as I mentioned, I believe, uh, by the Ford Foundation. Uh, and the Ford Foundation put up the money to buy the airplanes with and operate for a while and so forth. But the intent was, the Ford Foundation's intent was that it would become self-supporting. And it charge, there would be a charge for the services for the, ed the, the programs and so forth that were going to go into the school rooms and, and uh, somebody was to pay the fee. The fee was, as I recall, a dollar per year per student, which of course, in terms of uh, dollar value in those days, it, that was a little bit more than it is today, but at any rate, it was a small amount. Uh, and as time went on, it became obvious that uh, the income was not, the, that the necessary income was not being generated. And Ford Foundation, according to their rules, uh, they were not about to give any more. So the program terminated because uh, of uh, uh, inability to, uh, to develop uh, enough income to, for it to survive. But um, it did set, did set standard for outstanding education that it, uh, it would hold its own today. Mm -hmm. uh, so that ended uh, about eight years of, of operating and so forth. Uh, now that brings us to, to uh, a, uh, another subject and that is uh, well, what's going to happen to uh, Purdue Airlines in the near future uh, and uh, that's a, a, uh, another financial problem. As I mentioned, I believe Purdue Airlines, actually it's uh, Purdue Aeronautics Corporation, a wholly owned corporation of the university along with the PRF, uh, were doing business as Purdue Airlines in the airline that was established. And uh, it was, the airline was for educational purposes. And the thinking being, uh, kind of difficult to get the thinking uh, accepted at the outset, but the thinking being that uh, if you're going to train, educate, I say train because there, there's training and education are a little fine distinction. Uh, one's uh, more applied and, uh, uh, and the other uh, situation being uh, uh, academic. Uh, the, the purpose was to train pilots in a university course to be airline pilots. And uh, with uh, much arm twisting, we finally got that accepted that, that you would have to have an airline to train pilots on an airline. And that's, the, that's how we started out. Uh, now where to get the money from? Uh, we, we started with airplanes uh, that were Eastern Airlines fleet of EC3s, I believe I mentioned that. And, uh, and, and uh, the money was coming from PRF and Purdue Aeronautics Corporation and so forth at the outset, which wasn't large, large amounts. But as time went on, the, the necessity for the airline to have jet airplanes, since that was the way the industry was going, it, w it was necessary to have jet airplanes in, in the, this airline operated by the university. And 
that those kinds of uh, dollars were uh, a little bit more than what was being generated by the chartering uh, uh, and use of the airplane for uh, economy purposes. So, uh, by quite by accident, uh, a uh, a purpose a. a source of income turned up inadvertently when President Hubby played golf with Jack Stevens in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Jack Stevens offered to, to give us the money we needed for the jets and take stock in return. So that brought us to a point where uh, everything was going along fine, and uh, I hesitate to mention it because it almost seems ridiculous, but Jack Stevens got a divorce in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, it's pretty hard for even today for me to see what Jack Stevens' divorce has got to do with Purdue University. But nevertheless, it, 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 it did because as we needed more funds at Purdue Airlines, Jack kept putting up more money and taking more stock until he became 51% uh, of the airline ownership. And that was still no problem until the divorce came along and Jack had to strike up a deal to get the money to settle his divorce by closing down Purdue Airlines. Okay, now we're here with, without uh, an airline that we had worked so hard to get started and so forth, but uh, it, it was the case. We didn't have an airline any longer. And, but the program still uh, went on without the airline, uh, the, we, the university still had uh, courses and, and uh, students still got degrees and, and so forth. But in the meantime, another uh, 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 event took place which was to our benefit perhaps in that it, it favored students. Now, uh, all the time the, this airline has been running, uh, the students that for the students for which the airline is really here for 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 students, uh, the students would graduate, and I'll bet there was not an airline major airline in the country that didn't have our students. When they would graduate, they would go to work for United Airlines or American Airlines or TWA. We had students all over the country, and they were well educated and well trained and well thought of. So much so, so much so that uh, many years later when I was uh, in New York uh, working for the FAA, uh, I had responsibilities uh, that, that, that took me to the management, the, the operate, flight operations management of TWA, American Airlines, Pan American. And would you believe the chief pilot type management person for each of those airlines was one of our students. Uh, I'm, I'm hurting for the names, except I still remember one, the TWA chief pilot was Wally Moran. And he, he was uh, uh, one of our products. And then there was a chief pilot for American Airlines, and I'm sorry he's deceased. I know that, but I can't remember his name. Mm -hmm. uh, then we had a uh, we had a chief pilot at, for Pan, Pan American World Airways, and uh, we didn't have too much to do with him uh, because the other the other fellows and myself used to get together for regular lunch periods, and, uh, and it was just fantastic because here was our students uh, and, and we had the proof that they were well thought of by the industry in that they ended up in management. Uh, now that brings us to another little uh, touch with uh, events and you recall we don't have an airline any longer now and the telephone rang one day and there was a fellow who was the first vice president, I think he was, of an airline to be started called Southwest Airlines. 
but they, one, they didn't have any money, and two, they didn't have any employees, and they hadn't started yet. And his pitch was that he understood that we were shutting down our operation. Actually, we stopped flying the airline in 71. And in 1971 was when the, the Southwest Airlines was supposed to get started. So he said, and I can still remember, could I hire one or two of your better pilots? And my, of course, my answer was that we don't have two, one or two better pilots. We've got all good ones, you know. And uh, he came up to uh, my office here, and I gave him an office to interview employees from. And he kept repeating himself, coming into my office and saying, he was good, I hired him. And then he finally came in one, at one point and said, I'm just going to take them all, he said, if that's okay. So uh, I said, yeah, that's fine. These were, <coughs> had worked with the aeronautics, Purdue Aeronautics. Pardon me? <coughs> they worked for Purdue Aeronautics. He? No, no, they, or they, these were students at Purdue that he hired. Oh, yeah. Okay. These were our students, mm -hmm. yeah. Taking classes they, here. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. These are students. And they, they, well, they were flying in our airline. Sure. And that was part of the course, you know. Right. Okay. And uh, that clarifies. Well, some of, some of them were maintenance students, uh, and uh, um, but the, at any rate, uh, he ended by saying, "I suppose uh, you want to come to oh, you know come to Dallas too." And I said, "No, uh, I have a job to shut this place down and get it started again, and I, I'm going to get it started again." I failed, of course. And there were a number of reasons for that, uh, but at any rate. My objective was to get Purdue Airlines started again with somebody's money. And uh, that turned out to be Eli Lilly's money. And I was virtually successful in getting Eli Lilly to uh, start the airline uh, for the university, to educationally uh, based and operation and, and so forth. But uh, uh, Eli Lilly was going to benefit from it. There was a trustee who, I won't mention his name, uh, but there was a trustee for the university who was a vice president of manufacturing for Eli Lilly. And I had the governor, his name was Otis Bowen in those days, and the chief pilot of, uh, of the airline for the, that uh, Eli Lilly had. They had a, a corporate type operation and so forth, and uh, his name was Jim Lucky. And he, and, uh, and I, and, uh, and the governor, and everybody, everybody was in favor of this new start. Excepting for one person who was a member of the Board of Trustees of the university who thought that that was conflict of interest for Eli Lilly to be involved that way. And uh, so he would register his objection to this whole arrangement. With it would have turned out if the university would have proceeded with this and, and, and it would have come to pass, and it was felt that uh, this person would be embarrassed and would <laughs> resign from, his, from the board and whatever. And the governor said, I don't want to have to appoint a new trustee, and the university said uh, they didn't want to get into a hassle. So the whole house of cards came tumbling down. And that was the last. That was that was about uh, I would say 1973. Uh, uh, about 1973, when when this, this I, I don't have any real confident confidence in that date. Because, but I can tell you this: that in 1975, I left town. So it was somewhere between 71. Seventy-five. That all this transpired. Now, well, before we get off the subject of students, uh, and, and I feel so strongly about uh, everything I uh, I felt so strongly about involves students. All right. Uh, Did even you, you teaching as well? Didn't you? I? I was teaching. Uh, I was teaching aviation courses, of course, but I was teaching. And that brings me to uh, another interesting little tidbit, and that is that uh, my background, my education is in aeronautical engineering. 
but I'm teaching flying and the aviation subjects uh, associated with an airline and so forth and so forth. I felt kind of uh, uh, well, uh, like a fraud. You know, I was advertising myself as a teacher. You know, I, I was never educated as a teacher. Well, there was nothing to do but get educated as a teacher. So I went back to school myself, uh, and, and the university didn't offer very much at night, but I worked full time. My, all the time I was working, uh, I uh, was trying to get an education. But it turned out that four and a half years ahead of 65, 1965, I ended with a Master of Science in Education. Uh, I had to go to school at night, work at daytime, go to school at night, and then I had to go to Butler University and transfer a lot of courses back here because we didn't have very many courses at, at night and so forth. So Butler did. So I would uh, work during the day and then drive down to Indianapolis. And, and, uh, so four and a half years to, to do a year and a half work, you know, is what it was. That takes time on a part-time basis. <laughs> yes, it does. And uh, so anyway, I got my master's in, in 65. It's an MS in education. And uh, uh, that uh, perhaps uh, justifies my feeling about education. Uh, you know, uh, now let's talk about students. Uh, uh, you won't believe this, but I'm... Uh, a moment ago, I was talking about our students being accepted by the industry and so forth. Uh, there's a potential employer other than the industry called Purdue University who was interested in our students, employing them. So as of today, this day, the head of the Department of Aviation Technology is one Tom Carney. You may know the name. You may know Tom. Tom was an outstanding student, and, uh, and of course, uh, he, he was one of the students, I think I mentioned, who had a desire for more education than an associate degree, and a lot of them ended up with some bachelor's degrees. Mm -hmm. Well, Tom did just that, but that wasn't good enough. He went on, and he has a PhD in meteorology. And the first meteorology he got, the first thing, his first interest in meteorology was generated by the, the weather uh, department in, in the airline, as I mentioned to you, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. We had quite a good meteorology department. And, uh, and Tom was very interested in meteorology, and I have given him in recent times, well, in recent times, last year or two or something like that, I had a lot of stuff on meteorology uh, materials and so forth, and, and I gave him a lot of stuff because he was teaching a course here in meteorology. Okay, so much for Tom, but that's not enough. So we have uh, a flight department presently, of course, in aviation technology down in Hangar 5, and the head of that aviation, that, or that flight training department is one Larry Gross one of our students. So Larry is the, is the chief pilot type, I don't know if they can call him, but anyway, he's a, in uh, the flight department at, in Hangar 5. Along with him is, Tom, is uh, Mitch Brunman, hmm. uh, a Czech pilot and training instructor, pilot, flight instructor, and so forth. Then there's a fellow who gave the money for that simulator building down there fellow named Scott Neiswanger. He's a wealthy man today, uh, one of our students, of course. And uh, he he's actually, his business is uh, uh, air freight. That sort of thing. I'm not familiar with the details. But uh, Scott has done real well. And he felt like repaying some of it to the university. And he gave the money for that similar building which is past the Hangar 5 and 6. So, uh, as you can see, uh, I, I feel strongly, still do today, 
uh, that uh, if you're going to teach people to be airline pilots, you need to have an airline to teach them, with, which we don't have. Uh, I just feel that way. Uh, it's, it, it, I think I mentioned at the outset the justification for this, the, the justification that I put before the university to try and get them to do this, which they refused to do in 1947 when I got out of school. Uh, the pitch was that if a university can, can have a hospital to go with their medical school and a dental clinic to go with their dental school, there should be an airline to go with an airline school. Right. Yeah. So we uh, get some experience. We, we finally won the point, but unfortunately we, we lost it uh, for financial reasons and such. Uh, but uh, I feel very strongly about the education. Now, uh, I, I'm a little bit biased, of course, but uh, I think that it's uh, there, there's flying an airplane with a load of people in, it, in the back of it is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, a a significant. A significant uh, operation and, and, uh, and significant requirements on the part of the the driver, and uh, and uh, I'm strongly opinionated that that accidents are mostly, and this is true, uh, accidents are mostly uh, attributable to. You've heard you've heard the term uh, pilot error, pilot error. Well, uh, I think that's about right. Uh, there are other other errors uh, in aviation safety and flying, uh, obviously a mechanical failure of sorts. Uh, and uh, but the, it, it's necessary that the, that the pilots be uh, not just. Uh, uh, not, not, not just a, a oh, what, well, I'm looking for the right word, uh, a, uh, a source of, uh, uh, of knowledge of facts and figures and so forth. Uh, you, have to, you have to develop uh, an ability to uh, think and plan and make decisions uh, and, and so forth. So it, uh, it, it's, it's a combination that, uh, that's required beyond the academics. Uh, and uh, the way to develop that uh, talent is to do it in an environment that leads to it. That's why uh, if you want to learn how to be an airline pilot, as far as I'm concerned, you've got to be on an airplane being a pilot. Uh, but uh, so much for that, I, uh, I think that, 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 that uh, the days when I can get much uh, <laughs> attention with that kind of a pitch are long gone. Mostly. We are teaching flying okay. here. We are teaching flying. And some of those people who go to learn how to fly here will end up in, 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 in the airline business. I, uh, I I think that uh, uh, I think that I'm probably run down on that uh, uh, on that direction, and uh, uh, you were interested you were interested in s some other aspects of. Uh, Why don't we switch a little? Just briefly talk about the civilian pilot training. Oh, oh, sure, uh, right. Okay. Well, actually, the the term of which you were. A student. Yes, I was a student. Actually, uh, I skipped over a little bit there. The first, I, I mentioned that it started with 13 uh, colleges and universities by Washington. Actually, Grove Webster was, was involved in that. Uh, he was working for the Department of Commerce in Washington at the right. time. And it was uh, a training act. Was a federal funded. It was a federal funded. Oh, right. yes. Right. Federal and, legislation. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Grove... Uh, felt like uh, we should teach pilots. Well, first of all, uh, th this was uh, 1939, 
39, the act was passed. 39, something like that, 40, 41, right there. And the world conditions were such that uh, uh, it looked like there might be a war coming. And uh, Grove said, uh, and the military, uh, the Air Force, uh, Army Air Corps in those days, which <laughs> being a part of you know, shortly thereafter. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, there was a shortage of military pilots. And as a means of uh, uh, increasing the uh, uh, military pilot supply, we had to train people how to fly, and we had to do it at government expense, and, and so forth. And Grove decided that, uh, that the place to teach flying for the military and for the government is in a university. So you see, he was, uh, I, I, I pay, pay uh, respect to Grove because uh, we used to fight like tooth and nails all the time over one thing or another when he got here, you know. But, the, but uh, actually, he was very education minded. And so that's how come uh, when Grove decided that, uh, that we should have a flight training programs in the universities. And 13 universities were selected to start this thing off, excepting that there was one university that was started, that pre-started the 13. And that, instead of the CPT, it was, that was, we're talking about CPT, college? Pilot. Pilot training, training. yeah. Uh, and, but the earlier one was a CAA flight training program. One college had that here. So Grove, Grove chose Purdue to have a pilot program, to use the term loosely, a pilot program, uh, uh, the term other than airplane pilot, but uh, a, a uh, program that was uh, to, to be, test the system. And uh, so uh, uh, Grove, uh, felt that way. Now, I cannot tell you now whether Grove came to Purdue or Purdue went to Grove, but I have a sneak suspicion it was a, obviously a combination of events. And, uh, that resulted in him being... That resulted in him... Oh, that I, I'm sure of. They, they went and got him. But the point is uh, uh, the necessity for him to come uh, was uh, had several aspects of he, Grove wanted to get out of the government, and I guess there was a hassle going on all the time about making personal telephone calls on a government telephone and all that kind of nonsense, you know, and so forth. So Grove was rather unhappy with working for the Department of Commerce. Grove felt this way, as I said before, uh, about uh, a program which was his baby, and uh, and so forth, and and I. I can't imagine, I don't know how the contact was established, but uh, Ed Elliott and uh, uh, Stan Mickle uh, brought Grove here. And uh, to, to do the uh, first, first program was one year. I, I had nothing to do with it or any sort, uh, because that it ran as some sort of a uh, test program and so forth, and I don't know. I don't have much information about it other than it was called CAA Flight Training Program. That was already going at the time, before uh, the CPT started. Before the CPT, yeah. Well, it was the predecessor. It was the predecessor program. Right, okay. Yeah, but there was only one university, and it was this one. And uh, then the next year, uh, it became CPT. And, uh, and as I said before, uh, uh, I was a student in that. And uh, Did they in increase? They started out with... Oh, was it a small group or? Thirteen. Uh, it was thirteen, as far as the number I have. Right. Okay. And then uh, f through the years, it's always been thirteen. Sure. Uh, now the. How about the enrollment? Were there quite a few students that took advantage of it? Oh yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Okay. But I, there's some funny stories you brought up. Yeah. First of all, the flight instructor. Now that we had. Well, first of all, Cap Barretts was running the airport. And uh, the only uh, uh, the only surface, concrete surface, or any sort, was a small patch around the hangar, you know, you know, and so forth. And there was a bench out there, and where you'd sit and wait for your turn to get in the airplane or whatever. 
and um, uh, the Cap Barrett's uh, was running the airport and brought the instructors here and so forth. And one instructor was Pop Stair, uh, uh, Russell, Russell Stair from Mulberry, an elderly gentleman of about, I suppose at that time, must have been about 55. And so uh, Cap got uh, Pop, to, oh, oh, and Pop had an airplane. And he had his own little airport down at Mulberry. So he, he hired him, and, and he turned out to be my instructor. And uh, uh, others, students as well. And he, he was something, a piece of work to, unto himself. Uh, and he used to teach a few things which were not true about flying airplanes. He, that, it wasn't, it, it was, in those days, you know, it was not a science learning how to fly. It was, um, it was, see if you can get this thing in the air and stay in the air long enough. And then enough bring it down. I, yeah, before you crush it, yeah. Right, bring it down. That kind of stuff. So anyway, Pop was my instructor, and he, he had a method of teaching that was uh, like scare the hell out of the students so that you can get him to learn. And, uh, and so one of his favorite expressions was to me, and I found out later, others, you're the worst student I've ever had. You'll never learn how to fly. This is what, this is what he told me. So I'm getting ready, uh, I'm, I'm figuring uh, oh, I'll, have to quit. I'll have to quit this program and get out of it. I, Pop says I'll never learn how to fly anyway and so forth and so forth. Sitting on the bench outside the hangar out there, a couple of us, all Pop Stair students. And one of the kids says, I think I'm going to quit flying. I'm going to get out of this program. What? Why? Why are you doing that? You know, the other couple of us. Went, well, Pop said that I was the worst student he ever had, and I'd never learned how to fly. A moment of science, silence. Then the number two sitter there said, "He told me I was the worst student he ever had, and I'd never learned how to fly." Pretty soon, Jerry reluctantly at the far end of the bench said, me too. <laughs> so that, that took care of Pops. Uh, <laughs> but We all know, passed. It, it's funny, you know. You know, here we are, 60 years later or something like that, and, and I'm telling this silly story. Uh, but uh, I can't remember my name some days, but you remember something like that. Sure, sticks in your mind, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah uh, Why did the, the program, it ended in, uh, in about July of 44, just before yeah. the war? Yeah, well, it, there was another sta stage. Uh, there was another stage. Uh, I wasn't here, uh, well, I was here when maybe when it got started or something like that, but I went to service, you know, myself. Sure. Uh, the program now was a program for war. We were in war now. Right. So, so it started there wasn't any need for this college training for, for, per se. Uh, what we needed was a, a, a program, program uh, that was a, a, military, a military program. And that was called WTS, War Training Service. The War Training Service succeeded CPT, and that was a Navy program. Navy flight instructor program, as a matter of fact. I wasn't here. So that took over until the thing finally ended in 44? That took over from CPT, and I don't know the exact date and how they made the transition, but CPT, remember, was a college-based program. The, the, the government paying the colleges to, okay, well, instead of that, the government paid itself to, to train uh, I don't know if they were, I don't know if those students learned uh, to fly here necessarily. I think they probably did, but they were learning how to be flight instructors, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. 
the funny thing about it is uh, the, a part of that program, and, and, and I wasn't here, so uh, I only know from hearing some of this stuff, but uh, there was there was the called uh, the Inter-American Training Program. There was an Inter-American Training Program here. Uh, the military ran it, and I think that was a part of the WTS. Uh, I, I hesitate to have you put that down because I, I I'm so woozy on it, I wasn't here. Right. But so, you heard uh, of it anyway. Oh yeah, oh yeah, well now I heard of it to this extent. There was some Cuban pilots among South American, there, there were South American pilots they were over here. And they were learning how to fly. And two of them, three of them, uh, it's, uh, uh, Raul Cabeza, Emilio Salazar, Uh, yeah, the other ones on the tip of my tongue and I can't say. Uh, they were in this program, learned how to fly, and then went back to Cuba. Of course, that was the intent. And uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, the details of it and the dates or anything like that. But uh, I hired, when we were running Purdue Airlines, I hired some paid pilots, of course, you know. Two of them were. Ra Raul Cabeza. Oh, instantly, Raul married a, a Lafayette girl. And uh, Emilio Salazar married a South Bend girl. He married American girls and went back to Cuba to fly for Cubana. And many years later, uh, uh, well, when I used to get into Cuba with the baseball teams, I got to visit with the guys and uh, so forth. And uh, then when politically uh, the situation changed in, in Cuba from Batista leaving and Castro coming in and so forth, they were fle fleeing Cuba, as you know, still are today, you know. And so where these two guys got out of Cuba and I hired them and they were, they were pilots for American Airlines, or for uh, uh, Purdue Airlines. We still are good friends. Uh, Emilio died down in Dallas. Oh, th 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 those two went along with everybody else down to Dallas. And, uh, and uh, Raul is still in uh, Dallas. He's uh, not real well. But really, but not real bad either. Uh, he, he has these problems. Uh, but uh, when uh, uh, he came upon 60 years old and had to retire from airline flying down there, uh, American Airlines hired him, and he's, he went to American Airlines to run the simulator, ran the 737 simulator in American Airlines which was the simulator that Southwest Airlines used to use because Southwest didn't have a simulator. So American Airlines had a simulator and it had a flight training department and so forth and Raul was running that until he uh, retired from American Airlines. And he's, he's at home, we, we talk periodically and so forth and, uh, and uh, uh, Sylvia and, uh, and Phyllis uh, conveys it from time to time, you know. Sure. We used to go regularly down for a visit, you know, and the, and the whole gang would get together, but we would come to town, you know. Uh, all, all my people, we all go out to dinner, had a big table, you know, a big party, you know, like that. And little by little, uh, that, that, that gang, of course, has been retired, and some died, some have died, and, uh, and recently, Recently, uh, well, two of them, uh, two of them at least, uh, Bob uh, Sprague and Bob Pratt, uh, and uh, they took turns being the chief pilot, number one, the number one pilot. Uh, and they were the most senior pilots, so forth. But uh, Bob Sprague just retired in the last, I would estimate, uh, six months or so. He's still working for the company, but he retired or retired from flying. And, uh, and the university has a program here 
for uh, uh, distinguished alumni. You know that from Bob Pratt was made made the list. This last last go around, it, it, uh, it's been in in this last year. In the, Bob Pratt had already retired. Bob was older than uh, Bob. Bob Pratt was older than Bob Sprague, so he was the, the number one pilot for until he retired. Then when he retired, why well, Bob Sprague, who was in number two position, became number one pilot, and now he's retired. And uh, uh, but uh, there's still one fellow down there, and I can't remember his name, uh, but uh, he's still flying, I believe. But most all gradually have. Uh, Retired and some died, mm -hmm. uh, right. and when they took everybody down there, uh, they took uh, maintenance people that wanted to go to, and our art director of maintenance, uh, Jones, uh, they made him chief of maintenance down in Dallas. They took flight attendants. Of course, the girls are long past out of this picture, and uh, but uh, they they took everybody that I had uh, and uh, that wanted to go, and. Um, that you know their success story, uh, and the president's name uh, was, uh, and he's just retired, uh, Herb Kelleher. And Herb Kelleher has, has been quoted as saying, the success of Southwest Airlines, the success that they enjoyed, was due to the Purdue people. See, uh, when they started the airline, every captain was was my person, you know, and and about halfway down on the first officer list. Then then they were out of Purdue people, so they did have to hire some co-pilots to go with our people, and uh, and it, it, one one of the maintenance fellows, and I, I'm having trouble with names at this late stage of the game. Just retired. Uh, in this, in this last year, mm -hmm. so oh, forth. So, uh, Long continuity. Yeah, yeah. They've made a. They've made an impact. Well, they went down there with this attitude, and that is, we've just lost our jobs here. We just lost our jobs. The airline went out of business, and, and uh, we're not going to have another one do it. So we're going to do it. Sure. The funny thing, you know, uh, they had a lot of ideas about how to do do things uh, like uh, when the airplane taxis in, people get off. Then they load people that are going to go out and so forth, you know, and uh, and they said that they're going to give such service. And besides that, they needed the, they needed the airplanes to be. Pre it's well established that the airplanes don't make any money when they're parked on the ground. They only make money when they're flying. See, so uh, their their object was to turn them around. You turn them around in and out, thirty minutes. Me, I give them good advice, you know, and I say. You guys can't do that. You'll never turn those airplanes around in 30 minutes. There's just not enough time. You can't do it right. Da, 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 da. You, 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 you're wasting your time. Well, we think we can do it. We think we can do it. And they did it. <laughs> and they got famous. What, what they started to do, they did a lot, like a lot of other airlines don't do. And that is they used the back door for people to get off and the front door for people to board. And they were, they were doing... <laughs> Both at the same time, <laughs> but uh, they, they they were innovative and uh, determined, and still are. Excepting they have recently, if you read the news, they're in trouble with the FAA uh, on uh, some airplanes that needed to be inspected and didn't. That's because they got different management in there now. Mm. They got different management. Sure. Tell us, just share with us a little bit about when you came to campus in the fifties. What was that like? Was it not as well, big I as came it is back now? In after the war. Right. Oh, 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 right after the war? Sure. Oh, to go to school? Oh, okay, that was interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, I jotted it down after you said that, so I wrote down Skull and Crescent. Have you ever heard of Skull and Crescent? Skull and Crescent is an activities honorary, sophomore, oh, I'm sorry, sophomore activities honorary. So when I was a student, before I went in the service, before the war, you know, when I got to be a sophomore, uh, I was in the in the Zouaves. Did you ever hear the Purdue 
Purdue Order of Zouaves. You know what the Zouaves are? They are a military, crack military organization. Uh, I would think uh, probably uh, East East Asia or someplace. Uh, Zouaves. Uh, we we used to wear. Uh, well, first of all, we we used to do a drill with rifles. We, you've seen them where they, they, they toss the rifles around, you know, and throw the rifle up in the air and catch it and all that stuff, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, a fast cadence march. Well, I was in that. And uh, Purdue Order of Zouaves. If you get a, uh, you, you probably have to find, we didn't make the news too often, but uh, we did do drills around. You heard of Pershing rifles? Pershing rifles? Okay, this was a pr crack drill team like the Pershing rifles, excepting that the Pershing rifles were uh, looked looked like soldiers, and the Zouaves we had uh, 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 what do you call it? leggings, uh, you know, on and and uh, fez hats and and uh, all this sort of thing, and we did drills all around, you know, um, and. Uh, we would drill at the halftime of a ball game or something like that. And anyway, Purdue Military Order of Zouaves. If you get an old enough uh, uh, debris where they show stuff like that, you know, pictures. There'll be pictures of it there somewhere. I'm sure, right. Right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was in that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was an activity. That was an activity. Student activity. Student activity. And, and the, there was a requirement. Skull of Crescent was a organization organization of sophomores who were in, in an activity. Uh, it was an honorary. Uh, you, you had to make certain grades and, and all that kind of stuff. I can't remember the details now. But anyway, uh, oh, oh, it was also a, uh, the fraternity had something to do with it. Uh, fraternity submitted people that were in their fraternity for uh, for membership. Membership, uh, if they could get in or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, my fraternity put me up. And uh, so uh, that was one thing. But now, it was an activities honorary, and it was a, uh, it was a, it, it was steeped in, uh, in uh, uh, tradition, Purdue tradition. So, so before you could get in and you get in, inducted and all that kind of stuff, you had to know all about Purdue and, uh, and Purdue uh, uh, traditions and so forth. Like you had to know what the, uh, what the lion, what do they mean by the lions will roar, you know? And, and uh, also there was a walk over near the uh, Hello Walk. Hello Walk. You had to know about Hello Walk and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, anyway, I was in that thing, and uh, that was the, that. That was the way college was in those days. Okay. You see, no no remnants of it today. <laughs> different, different clubs. Um, how about uh, Chauncey Village? That's changed a lot, hasn't it? What Chauncey about? Village. How has that changed over time? Chauncey Village, where the stores Well, uh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there was nothing there to begin with. If you go back, uh, you got to go back to the days when the village was a bookstore, a bookstore, Deeks. And there was a post office there? And uh, there was a post office uh, right uh, uh, in that row, the, the end of it, on Vaughn's. Vons is now part of the post office, or the post office was, yeah. And, uh, and so from the post office, then, then going, continuing uh, east in the post office, there was a parking lot for a few cars, not big. And then after that, uh, there was nothing, okay. you know. So uh, little by little, uh, as the years went by, why? Uh, the, was the Varsity Apartment there? Oh, yeah, the Varsity Apartments were there. Okay. They were the place. That was about the first one. First and, 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 and snazzy, too, you know. Sure. And uh, it, it, was, uh, uh, it was a lot of, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, of course, uh, 
Now, if you, to put in perspective time and what transpired, uh, when I came in 40, the field house had just been completed. Uh, the field house was completed in, in 38, if I'm not mistaken, 38. Then there was a building uh, right uh, <coughs> Well, uh, the music hall. I was in the fresh, first freshman class that had uh, orientation in the music hall because the music hall was completed, I would estimate, in June or in the mid middle of the summer uh, of 40. So here I come in the fall of 40, and in the freshman class had it, we had our orientation, and, and of course, uh, Ed Elliott was the president, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and the armory was here. The armory was for here. For registration. The, oh, yeah. We, we were, the armory was uh, uh, very, very much alive because uh, the ROTC was requi a required course. You had to take two years of ROTC. So we did our – that's part of what got me into swabs and so forth. Sure. We were military-oriented. Right, right. And uh, – yeah. How about, uh, can you tell us an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with the researchers that comes to mind? Oh, an outstanding event? Or a favorite memory of Purdue? Well, I have to tell you, that at, the, at the expense of repeating myself and so forth, uh, I felt so strongly uh, about uh, what I have spoken to that when it came to pass that we were going to start. Well, Grove Webster came when I was flying for United Airlines and I just built a house in New York uh, in Hicksville. And, uh, and Grove came to visit. He came to New York periodically once in a while. He'd come out to the house or whatever. So he came out and this time, this particular time, he was looking it over like as he wanted to buy it, you know. And he remarked that the house would be sell, would sell. You know, I said, I don't, don't want to sell it. I just, I'm, I'm 10 months I lived in it, 10 months, that's all. Uh, we, well, we, earlier than that, before we built the house, we were living in a high rise apartment building in Jackson Heights. Oh, if you're in the airline business, you, you lived in Jackson Heights. Because it's near the airport. Yeah, it's near the airport and so forth. And uh, it went down, down, down. I can tell you, uh, many years later, when I went to New York to, uh, to work for the FAA, I needed to have a place to live. I had to get a place to live uh, and uh, uh, looking for a place to live. And we ended up uh, in Long Beach, a nice spot across from the ocean and all stuff. But, but meanwhile, while I was looking, I rented a car at, at uh, LaGuardia to go driving and looking. And I thought, well, I'm going to drive through the old neighborhood. And I drove down into uh, uh, Jackson Heights. And I looked around. And I had a new car, this rental car, a new car. I looked around and rather shabby characters around, you know. And, and uh, I didn't like the idea of stopping for a traffic light and, and so forth. Boy, I made a U-turn and got out of there. And I don't know, I think it may still be the same way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when Grove came and said, uh, you got to come back because we're going to do what you wanted to do. Well, golly, you know, uh, that was a significant uh, happening. Right. Uh, and uh, sold the house, made $600 on it. I, was still I didn't have very much money. Uh, and... Uh, you aren't, you know, you're not supposed to borrow the down payment along with the mortgage, you know. I had a mortgage and I had a down payment uh, <laughs> loan from another, from another bank. And, uh, Spread it around. Uh, yeah, so my $600 uh, paid for the move back to Lafayette. Good. In closing, any comments that you'd like to share for the, with the researchers in closing? Any specific or general comments and overall? You've shared well, a lot about the corporation and your involvement, students in the university? 
Well, of course, uh, obviously, I feel so very strongly about uh, what we do uh, academically, aviation-wise, and uh, I still get in, invited to, to hang our Christmas party every year. Here at Purdue? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, oh, yeah, the guys down at Hangar. I'm on the list to, to be invited. Uh, and uh, so, and, you know, it, it, uh, it, my, my feelings for school uh, we go beyond uh, what the football score and the basketball score is. Obviously, uh, uh, we, we've always been season ticket holders for, for both, but uh, now because of Sylvia and so forth, and, and uh, we, we, we've given up on, mm -hmm. on that. And so we don't get to go to football and basketball games anymore. Uh, she can't. She can't anymore. But uh, my interest in the university goes beyond, I say, these sports activities. Uh, and, uh, oh, well, y you know, uh, yeah, interesting things. Uh, some of the silly things. I told you, I think, the other day that the aeronautical building was built. It was an aeronautical building built. Small, little two by four building built new right behind the ME building. And that was the first aero school. Uh, there was a large lecture room in there, as there usually you gotta have a lecture room in a university building. And the professor was K.D. Wood. K.D. Wood. And uh, while, and, and K.D. was responsible for us getting our first wind tunnel. The wind tunnel was being built, being built in that large lecture room while we were having classes, you know? And, and I can still tell you it was a Dodge engine, Dodge car engine, they were powering it, you know? And uh, KD was something, uh, was required, we were required to design an airplane, an original design of an airplane, you know. And then we had to go into the wood shop and build it, and the, the model, and then we had to test it, and, and then write up a report on it, you know. And uh, so that was interesting. Uh, the, uh, the model in question, <laughs> there was, at the time, there was no such thing as a four-passenger uh, twin-engine airplane, a, a corporate type, private. So I designed a twin-engine pusher, pusher, uh, four four-passenger twin-engine pusher, uh, and a twin tail with the propeller wash would go over the. And uh, I, I and it tested, and, and we tested it for stability and all that sort of thing, and the, and the wind tunnel that was eventually built. And um, then I can't remember the details, time-wise, and all that sort of stuff, but eventually uh, the model was mine. Uh, you know, I took it home and, uh, and put it in my parents' basement in Camden, New Jersey. When I, I went to service, you know, and uh, my father loved to paint, and what didn't move got painted. So my mo model got painted white, old gummy paint, thick paint, and all that stuff, you know. And uh, but anyway, I brought that back out to the airport at one point when. When they built the hangar, that would be hangar two, that the, the big sheet metal hangar that uh, that's a lap today, and uh, there was a room in there that were that uh, they had all models that had been built 
for the pro program for school, and whatever you know. And it was a it was a garage where all these models, you know, and Pat Pat not Pat Bob, but uh, Palmer uh, George Palmer. You know you know George. Okay, uh, he was a professor in, uh, in uh, aeronautics, and he was in charge of that room. So. Uh, I gave my model to him to hang up in there, and that's the last I've ever seen it. <laughs> uh, that, that went by the board. Uh, of course, uh, little by little, uh, we've talked about buildings like the music hall and the field house and all that sort of stuff, but the airport it also grew, and uh, uh, Hangar 3, which is now what they call the terminal out there, you know. Uh, that was built during the war. When I come back in April of 46, that building was new. And then Hangar 4 was the next Hangar West, and uh, that was built specially for the Impati. That was one of Impati's. Uh, Overheads and uh, Hangar 4. It would take two DC 6s. As a matter of fact, it, it would take the DC 9. And uh, it's still in use in some manner, I don't know what. But uh, then Hangar 5 was built later, and uh, that was a kind of a corporate uh, activity hangar, you know, sales and service, uh, 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 read, uh, oh boy, uh, well, I can't remember the name, but uh, read was his last name, oh, I'm getting terrible. Uh, that gives a feel for the building of the hangars, how they, you know, came to, to for uh, yeah, uh, out there, right. which is good. Yeah, well, uh, uh, when uh, I, I guess now I can fill in where I forgot to mention, that is while when we shut down Purdue Airlines, and I said I left town in 75, uh, uh, I didn't have a job, so uh, uh, Reed, uh, who was the owner of, and operator of that hangar for sales and service and, and commercial uh, operations, uh, asked me if I would help him out a little bit uh, and sit in his seat uh, so he can get off from time to time. And, you know, so I hung around down there and, and, and uh, I didn't take any money, but uh, I used to supervise and run so he I can't make any name first name out. He, he later went into he later went into uh, real estate business in Indianapolis. Uh, I I left off uh, of course uh, well, I said I left town in seventy five. I don't know how interested you are in what I did after that because it didn't have much to do with Purdue. You took another position. Right? Well, I, st I stayed. I had earned a living. So sure. uh, when I left town here, uh, uh, an outfit called uh, uh, American Jet in St. Louis needed a, a manager and so forth, and uh, they hired me. Uh, I dragged my feet. They did not have a good reputation, and I dragged my feet for a while, and then finally I had to have a job. So I went down there and they, they, they made me, uh, I guess I was a vice president, come to think about it. And uh, it, it was, uh, they were in trouble with the law most of the time, and uh, they wanted me to get them out of trouble, which I did. And I went to my friends in the FAA and I told them you know, that I want to be here now and get this place cleaned up. You know. So they said, fine. Let us know when you want an inspection. So I got the place really built good. We had Lear jets, and uh, and 
as soon as we got it all squared away and so forth, uh, the FAA came and inspected and gave us a clean bill of health and so forth. So now everything's going real good, excepting that uh, the, the, these guys that I accepted a job from uh, wanted me to do things this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And my answer most of the time was, uh, no, it's either illegal or it's unsafe. So uh, there was a party one night at the Hilton Hotel down there. Uh, Cessna aircraft people uh, had it for dealers. And uh, I was invited. Sylvia and I were invited. So I had worked all day. And I had a beeper. Uh, and I went off. And they said, we need you to fly an airplane right now. We need you to fly a trip. I said, oh, I can't do that. I said, I've been drinking. I've, I've been up working all day long. Uh, it's just not legal or proper for me to do it. And their answer was, you're not very flexible. And I said, I'm very flexible. I'm just not crooked. So they fired me. That's the only place I've ever been fired in my <laughs> life. I, and uh, I guess I like to make a record of it because uh, it doesn't happen every day, you know, and, right. and yeah. so forth. Then so you uh, ended up, I guess, with the FAA. Well, n yeah. not, not quite. Uh, oh. I was hired by uh, International Learning Systems over in St Stanford, in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Oh, okay. We lived in Stanford uh, to produce a Learjet audiovisual training program. To produce a near jet audio visual thing for corporations to use in their, their, their flight departments. Mm -hmm. It was a year job, and then they gave me a car and everything like that, and, and it was a good job. And uh, then the job was finished, that was the end of that. So, meanwhile, uh, I'm on the West Coast lecturing at a seminar. Uh, for, I, I did a lot of lecturing for the Air Safety Foundation in Washington mm -hmm. uh, and in an organization called Traveling Aviation Seminars. And uh, uh, these were like three days in a hotel, you know. So I was on the West Coast and, and uh, <coughs> somebody called for me and Sylvia said oh, I was you know, in San Francisco and, and uh, we were living in Connecticut at the moment, you know. and. Uh, it was a fellow in the FAA, as a matter of fact, and uh, he said, well, I, I, I know where he, I know he needs a job, so we're so, so have him contact me, and we'll stop in Detroit on the way back to Connecticut, so I stopped in Detroit on the way back from Connecticut, and, and uh, uh, was, uh, I was hired right on the spot by, uh, See, I can't even tell. That's yeah. fine. Anyway, uh, I was flying all night on scheduled cargo, three and a half years of that. That was enough. So uh, uh, I kept trying to get on with the FAA, and they hired me. And uh, that, was, that was in 1980, I can tell you that. I went to New York then for the FAA. Good. Uh, inspector for okay. airlines and so forth. Good. Uh, and... Uh, and I stayed until I kept trying to get home here, you know, and uh, finally uh, uh, a vacancy occurred in, in Indianapolis, and I was able to get transferred from, from New York to Indianapolis. And we lived here, town, and I drove to Indianapolis every day for, well, well I retired. It was 88 when we came back here, and then 90, December 90, December the 3rd, 1990, I retired. Okay. I was 68 then. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Jerry, we want to thank you very much for this interview. It's just been great. We really appreciate that. And this concludes the interview. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, I, I, I... My pleasure. Yeah.